popular book, Gaia's Garden, A Guide to Home Scale Permaculture, a book which, a few things about it that I didn't know, uh, but uh, was able to come across. Uh, this book was awarded the Nautilus Gold Medal in 2011 uh, and was named one of the 10 best gardening books of 2010 by the Washington Post and is also the best selling permaculture book in the world. <laughs> organic matter over four acres that he's got 
He has doubled the bird population in, in his four acres. He actually has twice as many bird species as an area of a comparable area of native plants nearby. So, and I, I have said for years, or not quite said, but have thought, but haven't wanted to say because there's so much hubris involved, that permaculture could design things better than nature. But I don't want to actually say that. <laughs> but it's happening at Paul's place. He is sequestering so much carbon, creating so much habitat for all kinds of things. He is, if you raise the organic matter content of your soil by 1%, that lets your, your an acre of soil will hold 16,000 gallons more water than he could. So he's gone from 1% to 8%. He's holding about 100,000 gallons more water in the soil per acre. It's, it's just, it's so unbelievably win, win, win. It checks every box. It sequesters carbon. He, uh, he and some other folks have calculated that if 50% of the farmland on the planet were able to get its organic matter up to 8% the way that he has, it would sequester all the carbon that the whole industrial era has released. Wow. So, I mean, it just, it just goes on and on and on. It is so exciting. And he's earning, he's grossing $100,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So he's able to pay his farm laborers, uh, his farm workers, $30 an hour. Uh, wow. I mean, it's, 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 you know, like I say, it like, checks every single box. So he's training other people to do it. It's, you definitely have a system. I mean, it's, it's, it's heavy duty production, and they produce a lot of compost, and they use a lot of compost. That's probably the weak link, is they need a lot of compost to do this. Uh, but it just, I'm so excited about it, and it just makes me think, okay, if we could just get more people to do this, we would just cross off all of those problems, everything from worker equity to global warming and everything in between. So that was really fun for me to, to uh, see Paul Kaiser's Singing Frogs Farm. They, they do have a website and a bunch of articles have been written on, uh, on this place. And the, the, the one criticism is he's using, or he's, he has too much organic matter. Uh -huh. I just love as a criticism. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. All right, so yeah, so that was just tons of fun. It's got me jazzed, and I just wanted to start with something that gets me all pumped up so that I'm, I'm ready to roll through. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Permaculture City. Yeah, as Robbie said, Rogue Guy's Garden about 15 years ago um, was just blown away by the fact that it got to be a successful book. I just had no idea. I never expected that. It's transformed my life, and so it's with trepidation I right? we'll release another book. <laughs> and I just kind of wonder, well, where is this one going to go? So we'll see. This book is totally different from Guy's Garden. Guy's Garden is really a gardening, permaculture gardening book, um, very how-to oriented, lots of plant lists, things like that. The Permaculture City has zero overlap, I would say, with Guy's Garden, which is a sales plug for that boy in Guy's Garden. <laughs> and I will be selling them after us. Uh, the talk uh, and happy to scribble in them and reduce their resale value. <laughs> but it's it's really only a part of the book is about gardening because the principal resource in cities is people. And so it's really about how people can help create more resilient, more regenerative, more sustainable, whatever the word you want to plug in there, cities, uh, and have better lives in them as well. So it talks about, as well as gardening and those sorts of things, talks about water, talks about energy, uh, and how can we think about energy in urban areas? How can we build community? How can we make decisions together? It's not that we all have to get along, but we need to learn to work together, mm -hmm. at least get stuff done together. And so that's a big focus of the book, is how do we make decisions together? Uh, how do we make projects go forward? How do we decide what to do? And then there's also a big chunk on livelihood, is how do we sustain ourselves in the very busy and expensive environments of cities. So that's what the book goes through. And this covers, this talk tonight will cover some of the stuff that I talk about in the book, and also bring in a bunch of really cool projects that, are people, that people are doing in urban areas uh, that, that illustrate the various principles and things that I talk about in the book. So the history here is that Years ago, uh, my wife and I were both living in Seattle. She was working for Microsoft. I was working for what was, what began as a fun um, R&D company doing cancer immunology research. And then they discovered something useful, and it turned into a drug company very quickly. It just blew up uh, and became, went from, I was employee number 
70, and six years later there were 2,500 employees. So um, neither of us was happy. Both of us realized that our lives had gone in directions that we had never intended them to go. And we kind of looked at each other one day and said, let's stop. Let's just not do this anymore. So we sold our house and moved down to outside of Roseburg. Uh, wanted a place that was very slow and very remote and just get out of the craziness that our lives in Seattle was. So we lived in the Umpqua Valley and we loved it and it was beautiful and it was a wonderful place. And part of the reason that I went there was to reduce my ecological footprint and become more self-reliant and all sorts of things like that. And we did grow a lot of food and we did a lot of cool rural things, but one of the things I noticed right off was I was driving five times more than I have been in Seattle. I was always in the car. Everything was a 20-minute drive away. We were two miles up the gravel road. I also noticed that every single winter for that two-mile gravel road, we would all have to pitch in and buy 100, 150 yards of gravel. When my neighbors got cable TV, uh, they got a single, their, their line alone was a quarter mile long going to their house. Our well was on a neighbor's property, and although it was only about a, a little less than a quarter mile as the crow flies, we needed a half a mile of pipe to get to our house. And on and on, I just realized my footprint hasn't shrunk by moving into the country. It has expanded enormously. And that really disturbed me and confused me because that wasn't how it was supposed to be. And you can shrink your footprint living in the country, but that's not how American life works these days. Country living for most Americans is like suburbia, except with yards even bigger. <laughs> Over 95% of all the people living in rural areas have jobs. They are not making a living from the land. Only about 4 or 5% of them are making a living from their land. Most people have a job, and they drive longer distances to those jobs. So after being um, in, in the Oakland Sutherland area for 10 years, and we had a wonderful time, although uh, we didn't really fit in the community down there, I was commuting up to Eugene to buy organic food and to hang out with friends and things like that very regularly. Uh, but we decided, okay, it's time to go where there are more people. We thought about Eugene, but Eugene just seemed to be easy. It's just a neat place. I mean, so many people who wanted a little more of a challenge. And we went up to Portland, and all of a sudden, the car could sit in the driveway for a week, and I could walk to my friends' houses, and I could walk to the food store, and it was six minutes bus ride to downtown, and I watched my footprint collapse back down again. I was connected to utilities by 20 feet of wire instead of a quarter mile of wire. And there it was. I'm just, uh, so right at the same time that that happened to me, I saw an article in the New Yorker, speaking of urban stuff, um, by a guy named David Owen called Green Manhattan. And he had had the same experience of when he had kids, they moved from an apartment in Manhattan to suburban Connecticut, and suddenly his electric bill was five times bigger than it had been in New York, five times more electricity. He didn't even own a car in Manhattan, now he was driving everywhere, and so on. He had a very similar experience, and I realized that I wasn't unique in encountering this. So it just it got me thinking about cities not as models of sustainability, because there are no models of sustainability, to, really, but just what are the what are the advantages, what are the what's the permacultural potential, I guess, of, of urban areas. So I wanted to start by doing the assessment step, which is where we always start in permaculture. What are we dealing with? What are its characteristics? So what is a city? And the official definition is it's a bounded area that has more than 25,000 people in it. But being a permaculturist, I don't like that sort of static definition. I like to think more of a functional definition. What is it doing? What's going on there? And so I think of a city, here's the complicated way to say it, but it's, it's where technological and social processes outweigh the ecological ones. Or you can really think of that as there's more pavement and people than there are plants. And that's kind of my definition. So that's cities, suburbs, small towns. I mean, even my hometown now of Sebastopol with 7,500 people in it, um, I would definitely call a city. The patterns going on in any place with pavement are much more like a big city than they are like a wild forest or an ecological wild zone. So that's what, I, what I'm talking about. Cities, suburbs, small towns, all, any paved places like that. 
So really interesting things happen in cities. Uh, some folks have done research to find that almost all product innovation comes from cities. So for a consumer culture, cities are generating a lot of the stuff uh, that, that we use. So that's not such a great thing, I think, just in terms of product innovation. But some folks at the Santa Fe <laughs> Institute looked at innovation in cities. They measured things like patents applied for, new music and theater, uh, business startups, all sorts of, a whole bunch of different measurements that would look at in things that you could call innovation or new ideas. And they found that there was a really interesting relationship. It wasn't linear, like a city 10 times bigger than another one didn't have 10 times more innovation. What uh, this guy Jeffrey West found was that if you have a city 10 times larger than another, you get 17 times more innovation. And if you have, what, go back to that, yes, a city 50 times larger produces 150 times more ideas and innovations and things like that. So there's something that happens to us in cities. We get stimulated, and I know this happens to me, where I get to hang out with really cool people doing really interesting stuff, and I feel smarter, and I get more ideas. So something happens to us on kind of a logarithmic scale of when we're around other people you know, in, in anything resembling an urban environment. So a little bit about the history of cities. Where did cities come from? They're, the first cities show up between about 5,000 to 7,500 years ago. But the first real cluster of people that's bigger than, say, a little village uh, or a camp or something like that is actually a place in Turkey called Gobekli Tepe, which is about 12,000 years old, and it was built by hunter-gatherers. And this really turned anthropology and archaeology on its head, because mm -hmm. up until the discovery of this, the idea was that hunter-gatherers never built stuff like that. They were too, you know, the bands were too small, they didn't have the capacity, that the idea was that no big structures got built until we developed agriculture that would support a large enough population so that hundreds of people could come together and we could have specialization of labor so that there would be enough spare time for people to build these. Uh, this is a 10 to 20 ton monument and there are 60 of them on this 12 acre site that were dragged from about three quarters of a mile away. So this is big work to make something like this. Hundreds of people working for many years and hunter-gatherers weren't supposed to be capable of this. And it's very definitely a temple of some sort. It is a spiritual place, very clearly by the way it's laid out. So it's looking like human beings came together for spiritual reasons, and we all know that spirituality is a pretty powerful force, came together for spiritual reasons and then needed to intensify our food supply to support all those people who had come together. This is kind of the new theory of how agriculture arose, was that so it's really the city first, or the, the temple first, sort of coming together for spirituality, the temple first, and then the city, and then agriculture came out of that. So these would be the first places where people came together in really significant numbers. If you look at why we have cities, what goes on in cities, and again, from a permacultural point of view, that's the question we ask, is, is what's the function? How does it work? What's it doing? So the cities have really common features, whether it's ancient Babylon, Babylon that Herodotus wrote about in the 5th century BC, or whether it's, say, uh, the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan that uh, Bernard Castillo Diaz uh, with Cortez came and wrote about, they always have common features that you can recognize in almost any city anywhere. And so those features are, one is commerce. People come in to trade, to talk, to swap ideas as well as to swap goods. But commerce is a huge function of any kind of urban area. Security is another one. Here is uh, ancient Constantinople, or today's Istanbul, which is surrounded by water on two and a half sides and mountains on the back of it. Uh, and here is Tenochtitlan, what is now Mexico City. It's an island that's connected to, uh, to the mainland by a couple of causeways. So it's very defensible. But also, it's, there's more order inside a city than outside. People came into cities for the order that was, that was inside the city, as well as protection from stuff going on outside. So security is one feature. And also, the other one is big public monuments, big sacred spaces, gathering places, 
reasons for us to come together and kind of admire how cool we are by building a deity. That we, and also shrines to whatever deity or whatever it is. Uh, but we, we do grandiose projects in cities and we build big spaces that we can gather. So those are three really important functions of cities. Those are things that you'll see in any kind of city or town. is commerce, uh, some sort of order and security, and gathering places or sacred spaces and monumental spaces. So let's just go through then those functions and what they're doing. Uh, so we've got security from both within and without. We've got the exchange of goods and ideas and people. We've got gathering places. We have inspirational monumental spaces. And usually cities administer the surrounding region. They do a lot of trade with them. Goods move in and out. And, and often they are, are the places that kind of maintain the order or whatever you want to call that. Uh, which is actually up until really recently, the, the city-state was the predominant form of government. And most cities could only govern a fairly small <laughs> area around them, mostly dictated by the distance that a cart full of grain could move before the oxen ate all the grain in the park. Because the, the government would tax the surrounding areas, mostly in the form of grain in the early days. And so they, you could only tax about 100 miles or so out, because by the time that tax revenue got to the city, the oxen would have eaten all of it. So that was really the reach of most city-states up until about World War II, really. Most nations couldn't get up into the hills at all. Um, the valleys were the, the really nice areas. So, Cities are kind of crazy places, a lot of them. This is the ancient city of Yana in Syria, and it's a hodgepodge, and it's you know, no real order as far as you can tell, other than similar building techniques. And when the Enlightenment rolled around in the 16 and 1700s, the disorder and chaos of cities started to bother these people who were developing this very rational, scientific point of view. And there was a campaign to start rationalizing our cities. So around that time, you started seeing things like the plan of the city of Paris, where the Arc de Triomphe is in the central, cent center and radial streets come out, or La Enfance uh, plan for Washington, D.C. So cities started to get rationalized, and the chaos began to be stripped out of cities. And this move really culminated with, uh, well, Le Corbusier is one of the best examples, the architect working in the 30s to the 50s or so, where this is the city, of mo one of his monumental buildings in the city of Chandigarh, in, India, which is a totally top-down planned city, and nobody likes to live there. Mm -hmm. All the interesting stuff goes on on the outskirts. The inside is sterile because it looks kind of like this. Mm -hmm. This is one of Le Corbusier's plans. These are cities that look great from 30,000 feet up. Mm -hmm. There's no life in them. They're dead inside. And so this, this whole top-down campaign kept on going for a while, and it really culminated with this guy, this is Robert Moses, who essentially ran New York City and a lot of New York State uh, from the 30s to the 1960s. He built the George Washington Bridge, the Frogs Next Bridge, the Triborough Bridge, um, the FDR Drive, Shea Stadium, Lincoln Center, and a whole bunch of the rest of New York City. And almost single-handedly created the exodus to suburbia by building all these expressways that went out into the suburbs. He controlled billions of dollars just on his signature. He could float bond issues to build wherever he wanted. And this was kind of his program. He would go in and do urban renewal and rip stuff down and then replace it with things that look like that, which nobody likes to live in. And most of them have been torn down now. And they were horrible places full of crime. And uh, just, you know, this was the top down design for cities. And Moses then, one of the things that was going to be the culmination of, of his career was to build the Lower Manhattan Expressway, which was going to go right through Greenwich Village, you know, tear out about 800 businesses and houses in Greenwich Village. And what he didn't reckon on was this one. He lived in Greenwich Village and just got everybody together and essentially stopped Robert Moses' career cold, um, revealed a lot of corruption in his office, but she got people to really understand that it was the chaos of the city that makes cities really cool. You can't design a city from the, the top down. They have to emerge from the bottom up. But what Jacobs pointed out was this: these are vibrant places. These are not orderly. This is Greenwich Village. 
and they're wonderful spots for those, those of you who like cities. They're, they're fun and dynamic and constantly changing. And Jacobs wrote this great book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities, talking about how urban renewal was killing cities and how we could bring them up, bring them back, but mostly about having mixed use in cities, having people of all different income levels living in places together, to have businesses mixed in with residences, mixed in with everything else. Uh, she really looked at what made cities livable. She actually came up with the term social capital. That was a Jane Jacobs term that he was using until she realized that social capital was a really important feature of cities. So we can thank Jane Jacobs for the fact that a lot of our cities did not go the way of, of these projects that Robert Moses had in mind. One of the things that makes a dynamic city that I see is that they're often made up of lots of small pieces. Like Portland is the city that I'm most familiar with, and so I'll spend a fair amount of time going on examples, looking at examples in Portland. Portland has 95 different neighborhoods, so although it is a city of a half million people, it's really broken up into almost 100 neighborhoods of between five and 10,000 people, which is a typical village size. And everybody has a really strong sense of neighborhood. You know, I live in Selwood. I live in Brooklyn. I live, you know, they really identify with the neighborhood you live in. And each neighborhood has a neighborhood association that has guaranteed time in front of the city council. And each neighborhood also is part of a neighborhood coalition. These large colored blocks are where clusters of neighborhoods and form political units that really have a lot of political clout. Mm. So it's a fractal environment where you've got individuals who live in small, live on blocks that form up neighborhoods, that form neighborhood coalitions that form an entire city. And this is what creates the dynamics of an urban area, is to have lots of small pieces that are loosely connected to one another and talking to one another, and decisions go from the bottom up, and cities evolve that way. So, this, I think, is why Portland uh, and many other cities that are broken up into small neighborhoods are so dynamic, because the neighborhoods call a lot of shots, and you get local organization, local conditions that are being responded to, rather than things trying to be done on a whole city-wide scale. So this is what you get, is all these important functions and features of cities all talking to one another and going back and forth and reinforcing one another and helping one another and developing one another rather than them all being in isolation, struggling to get along. <coughs> so something that I noticed, and this drove me nuts, I did not like this at all, you know, and then I run across some new idea that I hate, that I don't want to believe in, like worms, earthworms are an invasive species, I don't want to do that. Um, and this was another one. I looked at all these functions and I said, well, this is interesting, these are the important functions of cities, why is that not on this list? Why did I not arrive at food production as an important function of cities? Because people are really into urban agriculture and urban food these days. And it seems important, and it seems like a good thing to be doing. There's usually a lot of reasons for doing it. But as a formal culture designer, I don't arrive at food production as an important function of cities. And the reasons for this are, you know, it's actually not an important function. It's a bonus. It's a great thing to do, but it's not the reason that cities are around. Land's really expensive in cities, and food is really cheap. So urban food is not going to be inexpensive unless you grow it yourself and eat it yourself. Even then, it's still it's pretty expensive use of real estate. Most of the, our calorie crops, the things that really feed us, need quite a bit of land. The grains and dairy and meat and those sorts of things that a lot of the American diet is really based on. Kale, green vegetables, things like that. Kale has 150 calories per pound. So you need to eat about 15 pounds of kale to stay alive. You've got to be growing calorie crops 15 pounds a day. So you need to be growing calorie crops to stay alive, and that's hard to do in urban areas because there isn't enough land. So vegetables, you don't get a lot of calories out of them. That's what most people grow in cities, which is awesome. It's great. I love to see it. It's hard to justify it in terms of feeding the poor because it is very expensive food, and you need land. It's like a lot of, lot of low-income people do not have very much land to grow stuff in, so they've got to get their, their suburban grown food from somewhere else. All the stuff to grow the food gets imported into the city. You don't have lots of manure and 
fertilizer and those sorts of things coming coming into, um, or they, they have to be brought into urban areas. Mm -hmm. The soil is very often toxic, the air is very often polluted, so the nutritional and health quality of that food isn't going to be that good. And the city boundary is not an ecological unit. Uh, we don't have you know, all the good soil in this area or all the good growing microclimates in this area. Uh, it's, and then it turns out that <coughs> transportation is actually a really minor part of the energy trail of, of agriculture, of, of getting food to you. But there's this, been this whole thing about food miles, and I've been definitely on board. The story that the average salad travels 1,500 miles to, to get to the user. Well, some folks a while ago did a study looking at where the energy trail <coughs> of agriculture was, and what they found was that almost all of it occurs on the farm or in production. About 84% of the carbon footprint or energy footprint of agriculture occurs on the farm, and only 4% of it, this little slice right there, is the actual transportation for food. So it's not a good leverage point if you want to reduce the energy footprint, the carbon footprint of food. You need to start working on the farm. It's still you know, a great idea to not have food travel very far for a lot of reasons, but it's not going to help the energy trail. So it's not a good leverage point. It's OK to move food modest amounts of distance compared to its other, the other components of the energy trail. So, it's hard to grow food in cities at any scale. This is Damascus. It's an ancient city, and it's pretty typical of a lot of cities. There's hardly any green space in there. Um, gardens were pretty much the province of the rich up until the development of suburbia in cities because land is so expensive. This is really the typical pattern for most cities and towns is you've got a village center or a city center with not too much green space, and then it's surrounded by the fields that feed the rest of the city. And up until the 1960s, this was the typical pattern of pretty much every single city on the planet. It was fed from the area around it until fossil fuel got to be so cheap that we could ship things long distances. Those of you who know the license plate of the great state of New Jersey, it says the Garden State, which just seems insane, <laughs> at least for northern New Jersey. And that's because New Jersey used to feed New York City. All the truck gardens and truck farms in New Jersey, uh, rural New York and Connecticut was the food source for New York City up until the 1960s. So that this is the pattern of People live here, food is grown here, the people in the cities and villages come out to their farms if they work in the farms and then go back inside the town walls. That's the pattern. So we're kind of fighting to grow food in cities. I still think it's a great thing to do, but we're kind of working against ourselves a bit to grow large quantities of food, calories, real food in cities. This idea of the city and its region, and this is something that Jane Jacobs talks about a lot, is the importance of the relationship between cities and its region. Uh, it turns out that the richness of the resource base of, of land is not as important for the vibrancy of a region as the health of the city that's at its, that it, at, at its core. Cities drive the regions around them much more than the regions around them drive the prosperity of the cities. This is why when Detroit went down, it took a huge chunk of Michigan with it. When Pittsburgh went down, it took a large part of that part of Pennsylvania down with it. It's why the whole area around San Francisco is so vibrant and expensive, because San Francisco is a really vibrant city. Same with Seattle, same with Portland. It's the cities that drive the health of their, the regions around them. So we need really good relationships between city and country. Uh, the other reason for that is that I think that if you don't get out of the city sometimes, you will go insane. Because we, we build these edifices of philosophy and intellect when we're just around other people, and we don't get feedback from the natural environment. Now, I mean, this is the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and those people look crazy. To me. Yeah. Those are not sane people, and that is going to drive you nuts. You know? And this is not a fun-looking environment to breathe in. And I think that things like the perpetual growth economy come out of an urban area where the people are not getting out into nature very much because if you get out into nature, you know that nothing can grow forever. You get feedback from natural systems. So I think that's another reason that these city-region connections are so important. 
is just to give us reality checks so we don't get so far off in our heads that we're developing utterly unsustainable philosophies. All right, so I want to look at a few tools that we use as permaculturists and how we apply them in urban areas, because permaculture has generally been thought of as a, a gardening and food production technique or, or design method. And I want to show how the same methods that we use in creating really cool gardens can be used to create really cool cities. The zone system in permaculture, how many people here are not very familiar at all with permaculture? Excellent, all right, <laughs> a couple, all right. Um, so I don't need to talk too much about zones then and what it means, but it's a basic permaculture design method. And it simply means that it helps you arrange the things that you use the most to keep them close to you. So you, you, know, you put your salad greens right outside your kitchen door, or a non-garden example would be the way that the typical office is laid out. On, you know, I sit in my desk chair, and there's my laptop right there, like zone one, really close, and a pen and pencil, and a phone maybe, and then the reference books that I rely on all the time since I'm a writer, the thesaurus and that sort of thing. Like, just behind the laptop right there, that's zone two, I have to reach a little bit. Zone three would be the files that I have to bend down to get. Zone four would be my library behind me. So we put the things that we use the most often the closest to us. And this helps us think about food sheds, about where our food comes from, and how we can not only shrink the distance that food travels, but also have way more control over our food system and create food systems that really support us rather than uh, all the things that a dysfunctional food system doesn't do for us. So if you use the zone system to think about food sheds and where your food can come from, well, the basic, the start would be, okay, what makes sense for you to grow in your garden? Try and meet a certain percentage of your food needs from your garden. If you have a garden, some people don't have a garden, that's fine, or they don't like to garden, that's okay. So meet whatever food needs that make sense from your garden, which would be things like stuff you'd love to eat, stuff that grows really easy in your area, you know, there are ways to make decisions about that. Things that are very expensive that you can grow, like I always have a basil plantation every year because I really love pesto, and basil is like, you know, nine bucks a pound or whatever it is, so it's a good crop for me to grow. So eat what you can out of your garden, you're probably not gonna meet a lot of your food needs out of your garden, so that's when you go to community-supported agriculture and community gardens where you can see the land that the food is being grown on, and you know who's growing it, and you talk to those people, so you have a lot of control over, you know, you can suggest new varieties to try, or methods to try. And if you can't meet all your food needs in these two zones, that's when you go to places like the farmer's market, where the food maybe comes from out of town, but you can at least talk to the people who work there. Again, a fair amount of control <laughs> over it. Then if you can't meet all your food needs in those three zones, and I bet you can meet a chunk of them, then you go to, Know, the independent groceries around that support local farms. And I'll bet that's going to help you meet pretty much all of your food needs with a minimal footprint and lots of control and creating a really healthy food system. And if you still can't quite meet all your food needs that way, that's when you sneak into Costco. And, hopefully <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't see and zone five is the least visited. We don't go out there very much and we don't, we try not to let it influence us or manipulate it very much, and that's really how I feel about cheap supermarkets. Mm -hmm. I don't have too much to do with it. So that's the zone system as applied to, instead of landscape, applied to food sheds. So let's try it a different way, the zone system in terms of relationships. So we're moving completely away from landscape and really looking at zones of relationships. Like zone one would be your spouse or your partner, they're right in there with you a lot of the time. Um, zone two would be children living at home. Zone three would be close friends, a little bit further away, people you see a lot in the lion, but they're not right in your face all the time. Uh, zone four, casual acquaintances, and then zone five would be you know, the, a nice checkout person down at the store that, whose name you haven't learned yet, but you kind of know who they are. So this would be using a zone system to design relationships. Like maybe there's someone who's gotten into your zone two and they really should be out there in zone <laughs> then another example of the zone system would be roles of a nonprofit. Oh, like you could say zone one might be the board of directors, they have the most influence. Um, they're the ones who are really doing a lot of the stuff, then there's the staff, then zone three would be donors, zone four would be the volunteers who help, and zone five would be the community served. 
Although some people would just invert this and say, no, the most important part of the nonprofit is the community served, and let's not try and deal with the board of directors any more than we have to. <laughs> and then a kind of fun example, uh, my friend Michael Becker, who I will talk about a little bit at the end of this talk, he is an amazing middle school teacher down in Hood River, Oregon, who um, took a permaculture design course years ago and decided that he would create an entire middle school curriculum based on permaculture, and he's won awards. His kids are, well, I'll tell you more about his stuff in a little bit, but he studies learning a lot. How do we create good learning environments? And one of the things that he found was that in order for us to learn, we have to feel comfortable, and we have to be able to connect what we're learning to something that we already know. It makes it very hard to learn if those two conditions are in there. So he talks about zones of, um, sorry, uh, I guess I, right, I'm at, I'm at the school, we'll back up here. So here's just another example of um, how zone systems in schools could work, uh, this sort of thing. So yes, talk about Michael Becker's work, this idea of comfort zones. So zone one would be activities that we're really familiar with, they're just a slam dunk for us, we're totally familiar doing them. Zone two would be, they're a little bit new to us, but they're not stressful, it's something that we, you know, we really like doing kind of new. And then zone three are things that are challenging to us, but we want to do them, you know, like I'm going to learn to play the guitar, I'm going to sound terrible for a while, but it'll be okay. Uh, we want to do these things, but they're kind of challenging. Then zone four is, well, I don't really want to do it, but I've got to do it, so I'm going to make myself do it. And then zone five would be activities work. <laughs> and Michael tells a wonderful story about he was he traveled a lot when he was young and went all over the world and and his parents were okay with him traveling, but his mother was really bothered about the fact that he was using public laundromats. The idea of washing your clothes in a washer that had someone's dirty underwear in it that minutes before really bothered Michael's mother a lot. And so one day he met the woman who he later married, they'd been together for a million years, and, and he told they decided they were going to move in together when they met. And Michael knew that that wasn't going to go over so well either, this idea of them going to move in together. But he couched it, he said, Mom, Meg and I are going to move in together into a house that has a washer and dryer. <laughs> and I'm so delighted that I know that people living together can just come right by. So this is how we can use this to further our own agendas and not freak people out, but also to, to create better learning experiences. It's connect things to things that are comfortable and familiar to us. So the permaculture zone system can be used in many different contexts, and this is something that I really go into a lot in the book, is how can we use these tools in ways that are not used just in landscapes? How can we apply them to human environments more? Uh, the, the other, the complementary part of sectors, uh, the zones is something called sectors, which are influences from off the site that we also need to design for, like wind and sun and fire and things like that. We usually think of sectors as things in the landscape. You know, you have to place your design elements in the right relationship, like you don't put a shade-loving plant out in the sun sector, you, know, you don't put it out, you don't put something that, that needs a still environment out in the wind sector, or you put your wind generator in the wind sector. So if we look at more human-built environments, this is a, a design done by a friend of mine named Larry Santoyo, who I work with a lot, and it's down in Morro Bay in Central California, right on the coast. And the main issue to deal with there uh, is the wind from the ocean, coming from the west, blowing this way towards you. So Larry designed this tea station, partly as a windbreak. But the other thing going on here is you can kind of see this gray house back behind the tea station. The women who, there are two women who live in this house, uh, this, the, where the yard is, and they, being Californians, like to garden with very little clothing on, and that was just dandy for the guy who lived in this house, to go through a second story window and watch. And so Larry put up this tea house, not only in the wind sector, but also in the peeping Tom sector. <laughs> and it's also a lovely place to sit. So it stacks a whole bunch of functions, and to me it's really a very nice use of this concept of sectors. So we've got the natural sectors like that, but we also have the view sector, which <coughs> right here is the kind of peeping Tom sector, uh, and we also have the neighbor sector. Neighbors are really important influences on the design. You know, if you do things that make your neighbors unhappy, you've got to deal with them. 
And then there are a bunch of other kind of human-related sectors as well. Um, HOAs, homeowners associations, are a really important thing in a lot of developments. Um, you can't violate zoning ordinances or you get into you know, your, your projects stall because you get a big slip on them. Um, so you want to pay attention to the human sectors as well. Sectors, Larry, Larry says, sectors trump everything. You've got to get your sector right because you can't change them. You can't turn off the sun. You can't, you know, kill your neighbors or whatever. You should. Um, those sorts of things. You can't overturn an easement or zoning ordinance very easily. You have to design for these things. So it's really important to do good sector analysis. And the human factors are a really important piece of it. Here's a nice example of making the whole sector disappear, the zoning city ordinance sector disappear completely. This is a Cobb Dutch built by or designed by Mark Lakeman up in Portland. And being out in the open, it would get rained on, and it was you know, too much sun during the dry season. And so Mark wanted to put a roof over it, and, and the city came to him and said, well, we need $6,000 for a permit to put up a roof that day. And so Mark asked, what's the smallest size, what's the biggest size roof that I can build that doesn't need a permit? And that's the size. <laughs> so here's your set of modules that covers up the place. But this made the city sector, the, the zoning sector, just completely disappear. And that's good sector of design, because you don't even want to have to deal with it. So here are some urban zones and sectors. Uh, a fellow years ago took a class that I helped teach, a guy named Bart Anderson, who runs the resilience.org website, or what used to be Energy Bulletin. And he lives in Palo Alto in an apartment. And he said, you know, I love the idea of the zone system and sectors, but I don't even have a yard. And so none of this, you know, put your you know, salad greens outside the kitchen door, that doesn't make any sense for me. But he liked the idea, and he started thinking of zones in terms of the transportation mode that he used to get somewhere. And zone one was walking, zone two was bicycles, zone three was public transport, etc. And he tried to arrange his life so most of his activities would be in zones one and two. You know, could he find a store that he could use? Could he find you know, the, the needed basic needs in the walking and cycling zones? And then he thought of sectors as the influences in his life, the local businesses, the big corporations, uh, community things going on, the churches and clubs and things that he belonged to, family and friends, those sorts of things. And then he, he populated this, and I have an illustration, a sort of fuzzy thing out of, out of uh, the permaculture city that shows some of the, the sector energies that I find in urban areas, things like employment and transportation and government and then populating them with uh, various things. Corporate influence in zone one is television. Corporate influence in biking, biking difference would be Whole Foods, uh, those sorts of things. So try and arrange your life so you've got really cool influences in the places that you're most affected by. That's a way of using zones and sectors, not really based on landscape, but more on the human community. The third permaculture tool that I'm going to talk about, we've got zones, we've got sectors, and then there's needs and yields or matching needs to resources. And this is simply, what do you got a lot of? How do you make it match some need? Or what does someone else have a lot of that you can get your hands on to match some need that you have? So if we do an inventory, what is in relative abundance in cities? What's there quite a bit of? Well, there are lots of people in cities. There are a lot of buildings in cities. There's a lot of built stuff. There's more money in urban areas than in rural areas, even though it may not seem like there's lots of money, period. There are more jobs and commerce, and as I've said before, there's more innovation and ideas. So these are things that there is in relative abundance in urban areas. And then we would look at things that is in relative scarcity in urban areas. And those are things like land, um, organic matter is often hard to come by, raw materials, um, as opposed to built materials, and time, or really busy. So what you would do is, is match them then. The things that are abundant, we got a lot of buildings in cities, we don't have much land, so the answer then is to use buildings to grow things. And this is not photoshopped. This is actually an apartment uh, building in Vienna done by an architect named Hunter Bosser. And these are full-size trees actually growing out of the windows oh. in the building as well as on the roof. So you're using things that are abundant uh, to get you things that there isn't much of, matching needs to yields, matching needs to resources. 
So doing similar things would be vertical gardening, where you've got a lot of vertical space in urban areas. This is, this is the only one that is an artist's conception. The rest of these are real. But this is actually being built in Milan, uh, Italy, right now. And it actually stimulated a bunch of controversy in the architectural trade magazines, where someone wrote an article saying, can we stop drawing trees on top of buildings? Because imagine if a giant branch broke off of that tree and dropped 30 stories mm -hmm. down into it. So it's there, you know, there's some problems. Mm -hmm. But this sort of thing <laughs> makes a lot more sense. <laughs> We've got a drainage system. You know, water can trickle down here. Um, so it's scale, I think, is important if we're going to go vertical. Then rooftops. Got a lot of those in urban areas. So if we run out of land, use the land first, because it's easier to garden on soil than it is on roofs. But once we've used up the land, then we move up to roofs. Also, container gardening. You know, here's someone who's just growing food in garbage cans, or out on their balcony, or they run a culvert type, corrugated pipe down their spiral stairs, and it things growing in there. So you can fit you know, where. How can we be creative about where to grow stuff? Or movable gardens. If you don't have a permanent place, this person doesn't even have anywhere to garden, but they have a little greenhouse. Shopping carts. Gardens. This actually came out of Portland, where some folks built a raised bed out in their parking strip out by the street. And before they even had the boards nailed together, the neighbor across the street, the neighbor sector, called up the city and said, they're violating the ordinance about how high you can have something out on the parking strip, and made them take it down. And so they built this, put their, their raised bed on wheels, and actually found that it was way better than having the stationary one, because that was kind of a shady place. And the neighbor actually did them a favor by giving them a little mobile garden. And they made it as ugly as they could to sort of tick off that neighbor. <laughs> so, so mobile gardens, and we got hanging gardens, we got two liter soda bottles, uh, bags of different sorts, um, various different containers. And you can get really creative about where you grow stuff. Then if you want to grow intensively, and this is somewhat controversial, because it's high density animal production, but aquaponics, which is essentially growing a bunch of fish, edible fish, inside a tank, and then Ooh. taking the, oh, right, oh. Yeah, oh. Yeah, yeah. there we go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be distracted for a minute. Sorry, Toby. That's okay. That's, that's awesome. It didn't make a reservation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's flying room only, pretty good. Turn the bear rooms. Okay, well he'll be fine or she is. So it's it's some sort of edible fish grown at pretty high density, and then the manure in the water is then piped into these raised beds, and it's actually the bacteria in the beds that convert the manure into fertilizer just the way a soil-based process would do. It's not hydroponics where you're using a fertilizer solution. It's actually manure-based with biology doing the conversion of fertilizer. And it really grows because these plants are 28 days old from seedlings. We can really grow a lot of stuff in a small space. So it's not a solution for everywhere, but places where land is really expensive, where there isn't much land, or where soil is toxic, or something like that, you could arrive at aquaponics as a solution for a particular set of problems. Um, they're, uh, they're all, well, let's see, they're the, whatever the bacteria are, the ammonia converters that convert ammonia into nitrate, um, they're just, they'll, they'll, they'll just show up on their own. You don't need to inoculate usually. Uh, and then one of the uh, questions would be, all right, where are our resources? Who's got land? Community gardens. Uh, a lot of people can garden there, although there are long waiting lists in a lot of cities nowadays to get into community gardens. School gardens, a lot of states now are mandating a high percentage of, of schools having gardens in their mm -hmm. states. Um, and so that is, um, you know, usually the volunteers or parents can get some of the produce from them. Another place would be apartments buildings, office buildings, and churches. Churches are starting to do a lot of gardening because their, their mandate is to support their local community. So church gardens. This is an apartment building in Portland where the folks in the, in the apartment went to the owner and said, we love the garden. And the owner said, mm, liability, cost, you guys are a bunch of flakes, um, all this sort of thing. And
and they actually wrote up a contract proposal and showed that the owner would save money by not having to pay for his mow and blow landscaping crew, that they, they basically just wrote up how it was going to meet his bottom line for him, how it was going to serve his purposes, and the landlord signed it, and they were able to set up gardens outside the apartment building. So think about what the apartment owner wants and try and meet those goals somehow to get your land. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about urban agriculture and just want to go into it for a bit is, is since I do agree that it is a desirable thing, how can we get more of it? And this was another project in Portland that was looking at how could they do more urban agriculture in Portland. It was something called um, the Diggable City Initiative, which was a joint project of Portland State and uh, the, the Parks and Recs Department um, was at in Portland, they, they first they did an inventory of all the land that the city owned that could be used for agriculture, everything from little postage stamp lots to hundreds of acres out by the airport. And they came up with 274 sites of different classes. And the interesting thing here was that they knew that there were more sites than this and couldn't figure out why they didn't show up in the inventory. And it was politics. It turns out that because this project was being run by Parks and Rec, the other bureaus, the Water Bureau, um, the Public Utility District, the various other bureaus there, didn't want Parks and Rec to get a hold of their land. So Parks and Rec then wrote up this, again, another contract saying, we're not going to take your land. We just want to put it on the inventory, and you get to keep it, and you get to do whatever you want. And all of a sudden, another 150 or so parcels showed up. That didn't. So there's politics involved in, in things like this. So once they got this inventory, then they looked at where urban agriculture was occurring and inventoried all of that, school gardens, community gardens, CSAs, farmers markets. And then they looked at, okay, why isn't there more? And, well, actually, first, okay, this is one of the snapshots that they got. Just This is a site of a little power substation. Here's the land around it. So good, good spot for urban agriculture. But they looked at the impediment, and the main one was that here's the city of Portland. All that red is areas where urban agriculture is prohibited by zoning. So pretty much identifies the impediment <laughs> to change the zoning. So they put together a set of proposals. You don't have to read the fine print here, but mostly it's you know, expand the inventory, create an urban agriculture commission, and adopt a formal policy, which they've done now. And cities up and down, well, all over the country, but up and down the West Coast, certainly Seattle has a really great urban agriculture initiative. LA just passed one, Portland's got one. Um, you can have lots of chickens, you can have goats, you can, I can't remember the exact number in Seattle, but it's something like you can sell $40,000, I think it is, a year of produce before you need to get a license. So really cool things. And you just need to meet a couple of basic criteria. So this is how we get more urban agriculture. There are ways to do this. So a couple of permaculture principles that I can use as illustration of really cool projects that people are doing in towns. Um, make the least effort for the greatest effect. Make the small change to get a big effect. So how can we take places that look like this, that nobody likes to hang out on, that nobody who lives there designed this, and that's very sterile. Um, how can we turn them into vibrant places that help create communities? And again, this is not Photoshop. That's a real picture of a neighborhood in Portland. Um, how this came about was years ago, um, I've mentioned Mark Lakeman um, once already, and I'll mention him a couple more times, and Mark has been here, I think, in this very room to do some talking about the work that he does with City Repair. And he lived on one of four intersections, or one of four corners on an intersection, and he knew his neighbors really well, and they talked about, wouldn't it be great to be able to get together more in our neighborhood. Wouldn't it be really cool if we could slow down traffic and hang out on the corners and design this so that it became more of a public square rather than just an intersection? And the first thing they wanted was a traffic circle just to slow traffic down. So they went to the city and said, how do we get a traffic circle? And the city said, well, there are two ways. One is you pay us $10,000 and we will build you one. The other is, if there's a fatality at the intersection, we will build you one. And so they canvassed for volunteers. For <laughs> it had been a good winter, so no one was feeling too suicidal. But, so they kind of went away dejectedly, and then they put their heads together and said, look, why don't we paint a traffic circle? And then they started thinking about all these other things, and they started brainstorming about, wouldn't it be cool if we had like a, a 
free box, uh, you know, a produce station, and you know, for excess produce, and library, you know, a library bin for books we want to give away, that sort of thing. And someone else said, well, on my corner, I'd love to build an information kiosk. And someone else on another corner said, I will build a children's PlayStation. And the fourth person said, I'll build a little cafe. I'll chain a thermos to a post and put a little table under it, put out some old mugs, and I'll come out and fill it with hot water every morning, and we can hang out and have coffee or tea. So they built this model, they did this drawing, and then they built this model, and they took a model in to the Department of Transportation, which owns the streets and controls this. And the people at the DOT looked at this model and just kind of went, are you kidding? No one's ever done this. You can't do it. We don't have a permitting process. Besides, it's public land, and so you can't use it. Um, and on and on. And so again, they walked out with their model, but there was a guy in the office who followed them out and actually followed them into the elevator and said, look, I can't give you a permit to do that, but I control the permits for block parties. And I can give you a block party permit. You can close off the intersection for two days, and if something happens in the intersection, Kind of a better to ask forgiveness than permission. <laughs> <laughs> so they did that. They got a block party permit. They painted the traffic circle. They got all the neighbors involved. They got kids involved. Go out and play in traffic was exactly what they had going on. They turned the children, they built the children's PlayStation and turned it into their cafe. They served breakfast every morning out in the street. This was really cool. They realized that if they built a bunch of stuff out on the corners out in public that it was going to get vandalized. And so they went around to the vandals in training, the <laughs> 14-year-old boys in the neighborhood, and so they were quite pattern literate, they knew exactly who to talk to, and they recruited them to help build the stuff. And these kids then became champions for all of these things and actually protected them from vandals rather than vandalizing them themselves. So that is pattern literacy of a terrific <laughs> Here is the free box and library, and here is the cafe, uh, all the old mugs and a thermos um, on the table, and here is the children's PlayStation in use rather than being used as, as the, uh, the feeding zone. And that's what it looks like, um, and it gets repainted every year in a different pattern. So it's this incredible place, and after it was built, the DOT, someone happened to drive through and looked at it and just, you know, oh, 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 oh. so it was, you know, they, they cited them, they said, we're going to sandblast it, we're going to charge it, we're going to take everything down, we're going to cart it all away. And fortunately, one of the folks at the intersection knew the mayor, and this mayor at that time was this really cool woman named Vera Katz, and they brought Vera down to take a look at it. She said, okay, let me get this straight. We're slowing down traffic, we're creating community you're probably increasing property values because this is cool. You've got a presence on the street, which is probably reducing crime, which means that people's insurance payments are probably going down because you're reducing crime and doing all this other cool stuff. And she just listed all of these things that it was doing. And she said, it's doing all this and it's not costing the city a thing. You can do this wherever you want. And so there is now a process in Portland and a lot of other cities called the Intersection Repair Ordinance this was a survey that was done, that most people in the neighborhood really liked it. But you go through a very simple step, set of steps, and you can do exactly that in your intersection. In Portland, I know they've done some in Eugene, they've done some in LA, and they did a couple in Sebastopol, where I live, they've done them in Denver. Uh, and so this has, here's, here's the second one that occurred, Sunnyside Piazza, where they repaint this great Fibonacci sequence sunflower every year. And you've just got more and more things going on. It just spreads down the street as soon as you build the intersection. All the neighbors want stuff. They'll put up benches in their front yards. Someone near this put up a poetry station in their front yard where you can put a poem in a slot and pull someone else's poem out that they've left to read it, sit on a bench. And it continues to happen. There are 35 of these and counting in Portland now. This one was where the owner of this building would not give permission to do it because he's an out-of-town landlord. So they did it in chalk over the weekend. They got their black party permit and just did a temporary um, village building. Okay, so incredible stuff, really cool work. Another permaculture principle is to start small, get successful on a small scale, learn what you were doing, and then replicate those successes to build up 
into something bigger. And we call that grow by chunking. Create <coughs> successful chunks with slight variations. And an example of this is down in Oakland. There are a lot of food deserts in cities where a food desert is formally defined as there's no food or nothing but fast food within a quarter mile. Um, Oakland has a number of those, as do many, many cities. So a group of people in Oakland decided that they wanted to eliminate their food desert. They wanted to have start a, a grocery store. But they also understood that they didn't have the money to capitalize a grocery store. They'd never run a grocery store, so it was probably going to fail. They really understood that was not how they should start. So what they did was they bought an old delivery truck, and they painted it, they fixed it up, and they went around and bought a bunch of produce. And they started making deliveries to senior centers and community centers and developments and neighborhoods, places where people gathered. And people loved the mobile market. They thought it was really, really cool. They bought another truck and got a second one. And then a lot of the neighbors got so into it that they started putting up community gardens that would provide produce for the mobile market. So it really got integrated into the community. It's been replicated in other cities around the Red Mobile Market Truck. And now they've finally raised enough money and gotten enough expertise to be able to break ground on a storefront now. After about six or seven years, um, people, people's grocery and opening is going to get started soon. Yeah. But now they know what they're doing, and now they have the money to do it. So that is growing by chunking, getting successful on a small scale, and then you can put the pieces together and build up. So, speaking of capitalizing projects, and how can we reduce the influence of money in our lives? How can we reduce the, earn, the need to earn? Well, there's some folks on the East Coast, Ethan Rowland and Gregory Landua, who have come up with what they call the eight forms of capital. We all know about financial capital, you know, save up money in your 401k and then live off of it, supposedly. Uh, we also know about social capital, Jane Jacobs' idea of your social network will help support you in hard times and vice versa, but also there are things like material capital, the things that we own or that we have or that we've built, living capital, the world of nature all around us that provides for us cultural capital, all the knowledge embedded in our culture over the decades and centuries, experiential capital, the things that we have learned in our lives that we know how to do, and intellectual capital, the intellectual knowledge that we have, and spiritual capital, that grounding that we get from our spiritual practice. And all of those reinforce one another and add to one another with all these crisscrossing lines are meant to indicate, so that as you build up these other forms of capital, you become much less reliant on financial capital, that these forms substitute for it, and also increase your ability to get financial capital as well. So we don't rely on one form. We've got at least eight forms. And these guys, their website is 8forms.org, the numeral 8forms.org. And they've got a book out and a bunch of cool stuff about how to use these eight forms to help reduce the need to earn, help reduce your reliance on money. Some people who are doing this, who are, who are building up a bunch of different forms of capital, some examples of this, the Grow House in Denver which is a set of five cut flower, former cut flower greenhouses that were abandoned when the cut flower industry moved down to Mexico. There's a developer who's built a bunch of fancy restaurants in, in Denver and decided he wanted to give something back to the community. So he bought these greenhouses, created a nonprofit, and after a few years of growing various things in the greenhouses, they now have five large aquaponics setups. This is in a very toxic, the soil here is just, it's in an industrial area, low income, <coughs> um, uh, ethnically very diverse neighborhood with a lot of unemployment, and it's very much a food desert. So they're growing food. They have a farmer's market in the front of this building that is a pay-what-you-can farmer's market, um, and it's actually making go of it. They have job training courses. They have an employment agency. They have classes for the neighborhood. It's become an incredible neighborhood hub. They're food-based, but also lots of other stuff going on. Um, working with this very underprivileged neighborhood, uh, it's just it's a really exciting place to hang out. I've been here and taught some courses. And, you know, the folks who run it, it's, it's a fantastic project. Really integrated into the neighborhood and giving a lot back to it. A developer in San Diego was going to put up your basic shopping mall and got a lot of pushback from the neighborhood, although he owned the land and he was going to do it, but he really, you know, there 
were starting to put some restrictions on what he wanted to do. So we got together with a lot of the neighbors and talked about, all right, what do I need to do to make you actually want the shopping mall in the neighborhood? And one of the things they wanted was profit sharing. So the developer offered shares in the development for $10 a share, offered about 450 people in the neighborhood bought them, raised about a quarter of a million dollars um, to help fund the development. Obviously, that's just a small chunk of what it costs. But what it means is they get a portion of the profits from the development. And it also means that this is where, from the mall, and this is where they're going to shop because these are the businesses that they get a return from. So, I mean, yeah, it's a mall, and it's a developer, and all that sort of stuff, but it's a little bit better. Mm -hmm. It gives a little bit back to the neighborhood. So it's, it's a step in the right direction. So don't, don't have to do it all at once. Little, little chunks like that. Uh, initiatives that I'm involved in and that I really love, my friend Pandora Thomas runs a, a place called Pathways to Resilience, where, and also Planning Justice, a guy named Gavin Raiders. These folks in Oakland and Berkeley are doing terrific work with formerly incarcerated people, helping them transition back into the real world by starting them off with a film culture design course, giving them some real skills, a terrifically successful program that has dropped recidivism rates tremendously. And they're just really cool folks. That's, that's Pandora. I have a terrible crush on her. I just think she's really, really wonderful. <laughs> awesome work. <clears throat> Planting Justice picked up the uh, uh, best nonprofit in East Bay Award a couple of weeks ago. Really? Yeah. really? Good for them. Yeah, they're doing they're doing terrific work. They were Gavin and, and those folks. Just awesome. Uh, project right near me, the City Hall and Library Building in Sebastopol has gotten a permaculture makeover where they have four different gardens, a native plant garden, a pioneer and immigrant era garden, a Luther Burbank garden, uh, and a more multifunctional kind of permaculture type design garden, designed by a guy named Eric Olson, who lives down there and does incredible design work. So it's out in a public place, permaculture design that the city is getting behind. Uh, funding, a huge volunteer activity, really, really fun project that's taken off, looking really good now in its second year. And also, public food forests are another place that permaculture is making a big appearance in many places. There are now dozens and dozens and dozens of these projects going on. The most famous one was the Beacon Hill Food Forest up in Seattle, um, billing itself as the largest public food forest in the country, but there are lots of other ones happening now. And what's, what's interesting is when the permaculture design course that this, this idea came out of, um, Jenny Pell bought it, and when Jenny started promoting the idea of actually doing this in a park, uh, the first bit of interference they got from people was, what if somebody takes all the food? <laughs> and yes. Jenny's, exactly, yes. Jenny's response was, that means we need more of them. Right? <laughs> and it, it turns out that doesn't happen. That actually the problem is getting people to harvest the fruit. No one comes in and steals it all. It's more <coughs> getting folks integrated to know when it's harvestable and when they should eat it and what to do with it and that sort of thing. But they're getting to be tons of these, dozens and dozens, all around the country now, out in public parks where anybody can harvest food and anybody can get involved in it. Talk to me if you want to make one here. There you go. <laughs> uh, Mark Lakeman's office in Portland is a kind of semi-public food forest where he's on a busy street, 12th Avenue, but he's not growing food out on the parking strip. He's growing all sorts of stuff around his office, and you can grab stuff as you walk by. So you can just do it yourself on a small scale if you have a, a little bit of streetscape. Then uh, just some projects that have come out of a couple of my permaculture design courses that I'm really just delighted with. This is like the best outcome of the permaculture design course. This is where the design project, that every, every course has to have a series of design projects that all the students do. Um, and they're usually theoretical where they just design some of somebody's backyard or something like that. But I've been pushing more to do real projects, to do design work in real places. An architect from one of my courses who lives in San Francisco proposed the Fran Francisco Reservoir, which is an abandoned <coughs> city reservoir in a pretty nice part of San Francisco that had been sitting there for 30 or 40 years unused because no one could agree on what to do with it and the water department didn't want to give it up and all sorts of stuff. So they came up with this design by talking with a bunch of the neighbors, and they put together a proposal and actually got FaceTime with the city supervisor of San Francisco. The design group went in and proposed it. And the city supervisor was so taken by it and was interested in the fact that they'd actually gotten neighborhood buy-in to do this 
that he took them all to the mayor, and the mayor really liked it, and the mayor talked to the water department, who eventually agreed to deed this land over to the parks department for a dollar, and it's probably $50 million. <laughs> it's about two acres in, in San Francisco. Uh, and it's now going forward. They're actually, after 40 or 50 years of sitting abandoned, this project, with some modifications, is not going to look exactly like what came, what came out of my PDC, but the project is starting to happen. So this, to me, is like the, the greatest outcome from permaculture design courses, or one of them. Besides transforming your life, it can transform your city as well, or the place that you live. And another project that came out of another PDC of mine in Petaluma, where I taught a course north of San Francisco, the vice mayor of Petaluma took the course. And at that point, the city of Petaluma had to come up with a new stormwater management plan because they were getting flooding and the infrastructure was getting old. So she set up a design group in the course that came up with a stormwater management plan, proposed it to the city, uh, and the city bought into a whole bunch of it. The permaculture design, infiltrate the water rather than pipe it all away, this sort of thing. Um, so really exciting. These projects actually turn into real things. It's so cool. It also turns out that permaculturists make really good first responders for disaster. That it's, it's the opposite of what you would expect, that the idea in permaculture, I thought, was to get to know a piece of land and become really intimate and kind of indigenate there. But it turns out that the skills that you need to do that, you, know, you show up on a piece of land, you figure out, all right, how do we meet the needs for food, how do we meet the needs for water, shelter, energy, waste treatment, community, livelihood, how do we go around the permaculture flower and meet all those needs? It turns out those are exactly the skills you need to do disaster relief. How do you take care of people's food, shelter, waste, all of that? So permaculturists are showing up. Well, they started in Hurricane Katrina, but they're showing up everywhere. In Paul, um, Hurricane Sandy, all kinds of places, and doing disaster relief work. And a friend of mine who worked for many years for USAID um, in Kazakhstan and some of the other collapsing former Soviet republics said that if he had taken a permaculture design course before he built his refugee camps, he would have done it completely differently. And they wouldn't look like refugee camps. So it's starting to happen now. The average time spent in the average refugee's camp is seven years. You don't just move in and out of them, you stay there a long time. So they want them to be good places. So I want to wrap up just by looking a little bit into the future. You know, we've seen Hubbard's curve, I think all of us, the fact that roughly half of all the oil petroleum liquids on the planet have been consumed, and here's the second half, so we're kind of here, about to head down. And how do we do this gracefully? What's it going to look like? And one of the things that I think is going to happen, I mentioned earlier that the nation state, or the ability of nations to control large area, really didn't get widespread. Uh, well, really, nations didn't start showing up in large numbers until the 19th century. It's actually a really pretty new idea. We had empires, we had city-states, and a handful of nations, like France, there were a few, but Germany was built in the 19th century by Bismarck. Italy was built in the 19th century. Most of the African nations, South American nations, and a lot of Asia were turned into nations in the 19th and 20th century. It's actually, the nation state is pretty new as being a dominant form of government. And I think that a lot of that is based on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. It's based on the ability to set up communication networks and command and control stations to get up into the hills where those were those wild people that the government really couldn't control until <laughs> really recently. So I think that the city-state is a more stable pattern. If we've got to have civilization at all, that's a whole different story. Um, that the city-state has been around for six to 7,000 years. And I think this idea of a central core with farmland feeding it around it is probably a more stable pattern than one that is a little bit um, less fossil fuel based, which obviously we are because they've been around for a long time. So I'm, I'm kind of betting on the city state as something that we will return to if civilization at all sticks around. I think it will look more like city states. But I'm going to kind of ironically um, end this by talking about what I would really like to see besides city-states is a world built of permaculture villages, five to 10,000, maybe 50,000 people at the most, um, built on this kind of pattern, um, small clusters of buildings, uh, and I'm in much more of a horticultural society than an agricultural society. So that's where I want to wrap up. 
And there's one more thing I want to do. I'm going to inflict this on you because here I am giving a free talk. So um, there, I have an agenda. <laughs> and my agenda is that I'm going to offer my first online course very soon. Uh, essentially, the ideas in the book and how to do it. I'm going to be offering this. Um, if you want more information about it, here's a quick and easy way. You can also go to my website, which that should be down there, but it's not, which is just tobyhemingway.com, spelled like that. But if you text um, PC City to this number, you will automatically get, you can get signed up for my newsletter, and you'll get information about this course. Uh, it's, I'm doing a free webinar on, on October 15th, and then um, seven class sessions after that that will cost money, but it's not going to be that expensive. It would be discounted down to about 160 bucks for um, seven class sessions or so. So that's my agenda, oh. my little sales pitch, and I've got some flyers and things like that for it. But I appreciate you all coming here. I had a lot of fun putting the book together, and I'll go out and do a few book sales after this. But thank you all very much for having me. stuff and I get to talk about it. So we have some questions. Uh, yeah, Joby, wait. what are your thoughts about density? There are some, they're, they're trying to increase the density down south Willamette and even progressive liberal people are having some kind of a nimby reaction to it. You know, I have, I have come to a, a restful conclusion about density because on the one hand, sprawling up into the hills everywhere is not a great idea. On the other hand, Things change when you shift from single-family dwellings and, and you know, small like triplexes and things like that to apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. um, I actually like you know, the things that you're doing with Maitreya, where you have more clustered housing, um, density in that form, rather than strangers all living together, people who kind of know one another seems like a better solution. But yeah, I mean, I'm in favor of density, except that the effects of density in our culture do not seem to be really good ones beyond a certain point. So I'd like to see a better solution than just building bigger apartment buildings. Um, especially, I mean, I think for me, it's that places to live should be built by the people who live there, mm -hmm. rather than by developers who come in, and sort of make money, and then move on. Um, that, would, that would give you a whole different kind of density. Yes, Kathy. Yeah, I was going to just suggest next time you write a book, be sure to include living liberatedsalad.com. <laughs> Um, I've been doing this uh, 25 kinds of lettuce, 7 kinds of some other things for 35 years. And it grows especially west of the Cascades without any protective coverings, even when the snow covers it, it doesn't destroy the plants. And I wanted to say that uh, Joshua Smith couldn't come tonight, but he's writing a couple books on permaculture too. He's a local man. And he, uh, he told me that 95% of all fruit and nut trees that get planted are the wrong variety planted in the wrong place. And I took him out to several properties. I'm a real estate agent. I took him out, and he showed me so many times where people put the wrong variety in the wrong place. And I was wondering if you knew about Salvia, which is Anna Edie's book. Now, she spoke at the Bioneers Conference years ago, and she was making $3,000 a month with her greenhouse, heating it with chicken breath in New England, and then uh, diluting urine uh, 10%. And then finally, do you know about growingagreenerworld.com? A great series online of uh, things you can uh, listen. It's on TV and also online. Cool. All right. Thanks, Matthew, for the resources. That's just great. Any other questions before I wander out and uh, autograph a few more books? Yes. In your tr travels and experiences, have you found any places where people are removing streets and replacing them with agriculture? There is a, only a teeny bit of it. There's actually an outfit in Portland called Depave mm -hmm. that has at least prevented the city from, paint, from paving a few areas that are not paved. They actually have only done a small amount of ripping up pavement in people's yards. Uh, but I haven't run across actual areas. I mean, my, my sense is we've got basically twice as many streets as we need. And I love the idea of ripping up every other street. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not seeing too much of it there. Yes. I had some friends who lived in Whitaker, and, and they actually ended up uh, getting permission to take the alley out. They had to have people on both sides of the alley mm -hmm. agree to that. Mm -hmm. And since they did, they took it out of the garden. Great, there we go. That's kind of a nice example. example. Mm -hmm. right, that's good. Yeah, alleys are probably an easier rubbish. That's it, yeah. um, Well, one of the advantages of the city is, uh, as you said, the increased creativity and innovation and, and exchange of ideas. And, you know, in the US, the the pattern is rural areas are very conservative and cities are much more progressive. Um, so I'm wondering how do we how do we uh, cultivate rural, progressive
choice of community is really important, and I think creating good models, you know, it's, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'd love to change people's ideology, but if we can give them a model of kind of a better way of living, a more satisfied way of living, I think their ideology will start to come around. You know, so that's, that's kind of my goal, is just create really cool models of, you know, hey, come over here, isn't this great? Wouldn't you like to be doing this? And then I start to see people's minds start to change when they when you start doing that. But yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it's, cities tend to be the more progressive areas. And again, it's that city region <coughs> connection that I think right. helps that. Right. Yes. Toby, the last photo in your presentation was of a permaculture village situation. Where was that? Uh, this one actually was in, um, this is in, it's one of the eastern, it's in Bulgaria, actually. Wow, yeah. yeah, kind of, kind of interesting. Um, places that were sort of not, you know, communism sort of put everything into a deep freeze for about 50 years. So a lot of these old places really got preserved and restored. And that's a little village at the front, and then there's another. Yeah, there, there are just clusters of them. Yeah, there's a whole, whole string of them there. Yeah, yeah. It's very sweet. It is sweet, yes. I would, if I spoke Bulgarian, I would go ahead and work with it. My perception is that Havana is a poster child for urban. Right. Is that accurate? It's, it's a little less so now that they've gotten the oil from Venezuela to start flowing again. Yeah, Havana, after the, and I think most of you are familiar with that, but, um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Cuba had been heavily dependent on lots of oil and lots of fertilizer from the Soviet Union. They pretty much went completely cold turkey. And the average Cuban lost 20 pounds, I think it was. Um, but Havana wound up being able to produce 80% of its own food, all of its own food within the city limits, um, not just vegetables. So it can be done, um, and they, they needed to. There was no other place to get food. So yeah, Cuba has been not quite as much as it was, but definitely one of the best examples of becoming food self-reliant really quickly. Uh, and a lot of people do say, well, it helps if you're a totalitarian state where Raul Castro could just say, we're turning on, on a dime, and everybody does it. I think need also can help uh, provide that as well. Yes? Yeah, um, I'd actually actually like to, uh, I'd like to ask the group for a uh, donational support to buy your book. <laughs> and by the way, the, the donation basket, none of that's going to me, it's going to these guys who are set it up. Um, so please give generously to help, help support the people who are possible as well. Well, I'm going to wander out, hang out, and sign some books and chat, and all that sort of thing.